Well, it is a thrill to be with you and to minister God's Word. If you want to open back to Colossians 3, uh, we're going to continue with uh, Paul's teaching of those dear Colossian saints. And as we're turning there, I don't know if I ever introduced my wonderful wife. I've talked about her a lot. Have I talked about my wife at all? My first wife, uh, my girlfriend, uh, my best friend, mother of our eight children, um, Bonnie and I have been married for 33 years, and uh, uh, the Lord did not bless us with any perfect children. Uh, he only blessed us with uh, sinners, fallen. Uh, um, they have imperfect parents, and uh, with imperfect parenting, and it's been a joy to see the, the wonder of what God can do with those children. Our oldest son uh, and his wife uh, live out in San Francisco, of all places, uh, and they are living for the Lord. Uh, he works in the social media industry, and his wife uh, worked at Stanford University with uh, autism and the spectral, you know, all the, the children suffering with uh, autism. And uh, now they uh, had their first child, and we have finally become, on Jul June 20th, I think, uh, grandparents, and we're so excited. And it, it's a blessing. Our next uh, oldest child, Estelle, is, uh, started a, a Christian school in Honduras on the North Shore. And uh, they now have 120 uh, students. And basically, it's rescuing them. I don't know if you know much about Honduras. It has the third and the fourth highest murder rate in the world in two of their cities, Tegucigalpa and San Pedro. And so they make headlines for being the murder capital. They are only exceeded by Acapulco and I forget the other one uh, with the drug trafficking. But in that country, when a girl gets to be about 11, if she's not in school wearing a uniform, they snatch them, take them into Tegus or San Pedro Sula, and they become prostitutes. And usually they let them go about 20, 22. They look 40 or 50, and they usually die soon after of HIV AIDS because they're just kept and used in the city. So the missionaries there on the North Shore had a burden, and they found out that if you teach young people English, you can make more money, any young lady can make more money if she speaks English working than you can as a prostitute. How do you like that? And so the parents, unsaved, say, send them to the Christian school to preserve them from being trafficked. And so... Uh, they started the school seven years ago, and they have 120. My other daughter is the administrator of the hospital. So those two, if you love missions, if you have missionaries in your house, over for dinner, staying with you, watch out, because guess what? Your kids become missionaries, and then you only see them once in a while, but uh, you're grateful for it. Our next son is the uh, director of Building 7 at the Denver Gospel Mission, downtown Denver. Uh, his building, there are nine buildings in the complex, his building has 3,000 homeless a day. I mean, Denver is mushrooming. It's now the second or third largest homeless population, and their mission is the second or third largest homeless uh, shelter. And, and uh, he loves that ministry. Our next uh, oldest son, uh, Joseph, is uh, in school. He's going to be a missionary surgeon. The next uh, youngest is uh, Jeremiah. He's at UCLA. Our next youngest is a graphic artist uh, in Kalamazoo nearby here. And then our youngest, who just turned 18, uh, is a carbon copy of her mother. And she's a junior at Western. She wants to be a neurologist. Uh, she's right now working in the labs with Pfizer on... Uh, Alzheimer's uh, drugs. Uh, if you know, the, the big drug companies are always experimenting with drugs, and they try and get them approved, and they had an eye drop that was uh, for glaucoma or something, and the FDA said, after millions of dollars developing this eye drop, they said, no, you can't use it. So they donate those to the Western Michigan University to see what else you can do with it, and they started putting the eye drops in the eyes of rats, and it completely fired up their, the back part of their brain. I, I'm not neurologically inclined. I don't even know what it is. But it's the part that slowly dies when you have Alzheimer's. And they found out that these eye drops are very powerful for um, doing. What do I have to do, Nate? Or Nate's not even here. I told him it wouldn't work because he turns them off. You notice that. Have you noticed the pattern? They turn off the projectors. They never come back on. So uh, I'll just keep talking until... Okay, and I'll, I'll do one plug and unplug. I came over and I said, you know what, Nate, it's not going to work if you turn them off, but 
Who am I to tell the tech guy what to do? Uh, so, so Bonnie and I raised our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And one time, uh, actually our first child was so sweet, I only wanted to have one child. And our, our first child was so, no, I only wanted to have one. Our first child was so bad, he used to dive out of the shopping cart. I said, honey, I don't want any more children. And so she said, come on, honey, let's pray about it. So we had our second child. She was so sweet. I said, wow, if all kids were like that, I'd like a whole carload of them. And so our third child was so bad, I decided we didn't want any more. Our fourth child was so sweet that I decided. And so we just kept going like that and, uh, until we finally have a complete set of eight. And we have every type of personality. There are four personality types. We have two of each, uh, if you know what they are. And it's such a blessing to see how the Lord uniquely gifts us to reach our generation for Christ in the unique personality he gave us. And so I decided that I would read through, because it was such a challenge parenting, eight children. I thought, I've, I've read Dobson's books and you know everybody's books on children, but I, I've never studied everything the Bible said. And so I spent a whole year of my life reading through every family in the Bible. Not just what it says in Proverbs, but every family in Genesis and all the reflections on what Moses was doing with his boys, you know, that ended up being part of the whole uh, Levitical system. And then looking through all of the, the judges' children and then David. I mean, he's monumental. There's more chapters about him. And when I got all done, uh, I wrote, and I have it in the back, it's called The Joy of a Word-Filled Family. And here's the conclusion of the whole book. The Bible never has a single, what we would call, model family. There isn't one. Unless you count John the Baptist's parents, Zachariah and Elizabeth, two elderly people that have a son who wears a modified Tarzan outfit, never cuts his hair, and lives in the wilderness, eating bugs. I mean, how would you like that, to have that as your son? And so, in the scriptures, what we find is that that. There is no model family. I think a lot of parents struggle because they, they want to have kind of the Norman Rockwell family where everybody sits around like this. That isn't usually how it is. How it is is that it's a struggle and the greatest sanctifying ministry in our life next to marriage is parenting. Marriage reveals how selfish we are when we have to you know, sacrifice for someone else. And children reveal all of our weaknesses living and talking and growing in front of us. And that's what children are. They're just such a reflection of all that. And so uh, I preached through this for a year. And um, little did I know that in the back row was the dear woman that had written almost all of Bill Gothard. You ever heard of Bill Gothard? You know, the, the uh, basic youth conflict. The woman that was his editor that wrote all of his books I didn't even know she attended our church in, in uh, Tulsa at that time. And so she came to me one day and presented to me a notebook this thick, and she says, I have transcribed and edited. She said, uh, this is your year of sermons, but she says only this much of it was good. <laughs> Thanks a lot. But she gave me the manuscript, and she said, I did this. It took me months because she said, I would like you to allow me to translate it into Spanish and send it out to missionaries. Well, so she did that. And in the midst of that, the Slavic Gospel Ministry set came to me and said, could we have it? We want to publish it in Russian. And then another ministry came and said, could we publish it in Arabic? And then another said, could we do it in Korean? And finally, we got it in English. So what's amazing is my first book was first in Spanish, Russian, Arabic, Korean, I forget what other language, Portuguese, but now it's in English. The reason I say that is parenting is very hard. And we're looking at the next generation not being raised like we were. Around the table, praying. Around the table. They don't even sit together for meals anymore, most families. Everybody's in their own room. They text each other. They watch television. They play games. They're watching movies. The whole idea of Deuteronomy 6, which is what this book is is centered around about speaking of the Lord when you rise up when you walk through the day when you sit at the meals and when you go to bed those four points of contact with families growing in the nurture and admonition of the Lord is really very rare and so what Bonnie and I have done actually this is a four-part book that teaches people how to cultivate personally a word-filled life that's the first fourth Then the next part is how to have a word-filled marriage, how to really 
do what it says in Ephesians 5, then how to parent a word-filled family, but I love the last whole section is how to pray for your children for life. Uh, we had, obviously, not any perfect children, but we had one really bad son. He didn't even get saved till he was 18. We didn't even know that. He was our best verse-learning Awana kid of all. He had the biggest smile. Nobody didn't like him. He was the most friendly person until he turned 16. And then he told us, he said, you'll never see me again. I'll never invite you to my wedding. I won't come to your funeral. I don't want anything to do with you. I've never believed this anyway. And he went out and lived on the street. How would you like to have a son move out at 16 and live on the street? Well, we didn't sleep for the next two years. We prayed constantly for him. We used to pick him up every time he got in trouble and bring him home and help him, and then he'd leave again. But we always said, Lord, do whatever it takes to get his attention. And so things started happening to him. He was coming home one time, uh, wanting to stay at home, and he was cutting through horse pastures in the middle of the night, two or three in the morning, in the dark, and he stepped on a stallion. You know, horses sleep on the ground. And that horse was sound asleep, and he stepped on him, and they are so afraid of rattlesnakes that it rose up, knocking him to the ground, and started going boom with its hoofs on the ground because they try and kill the snakes. And he said he laid there, and that 1,200-pound horse was going boom on both sides of his head, boom. And he thought, wow, four inches, and I'm a goner. And he came home, told us the story, but went right back to his ways. But what he said is, will you stop praying for me? You're ruining my life. Because he felt the Lord trying to get his attention. Well, finally he had a terrible accident when he was, the night before his 18th birthday. Uh, we, were, we finally had gone to sleep. It was about 3 in the morning. The phone rang, my cell phone. I picked it up, and he said, Dad, I just want you to know I'm laying in the middle of I-69, 169, that's a uh, road in Oklahoma. He said, I'm laying face down. He said, I can see my own blood on the pavement. And he said, I'm, I'm sure I'm dying. But he said, I was in a car accident and as the steering wheel crushed, it actually did crush his chest and punctured his lungs. He said, as it was going, he said, I realized that the Lord wanted my attention. He says, right there holding on to the steering wheel, he said, I cried out to the Lord, and he said, he saved me. So he said, I'm at exit whatever, but he said, if, if I don't make it, I want you to know that you'll see me again. What a phone call to get at 2 in the morning. Bonnie and I raced up to there, and we got there before the emergency people did, and there he was laying in this great big circle of blood face down. The other guy in the car was standing there not knowing what to do. He was totally uninjured. And our son was, went to the ICU. But after that, the Lord got a hold of his heart. Uh, he still struggles from his injuries, but he's the one that's leading Building 7 of the Denver Gospel Mission. And he says he talks to those homeless guys, and they'll tell him a story, and he'll say, you know what, you're lying to me. I lived on the street, too, and I know what you're saying, and you're lying. And they go, you lived on the street? He said, mm-hmm. And then he tells them how Christ saved him and gave him a reason for life. And so see, the, the Lord can use anything in our lives for his glory. And that's part of what I want to share with you. And in your notes, uh, this is the next blank, the two sides of saving faith. Remember what I told you, there's justification and sanctification. Justification is what Christ did for me on the cross. So when you think of how... How do you know the difference between justification and sanctification? Because that's what Colossians 3 is talking about. In verse 12, it says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. How do we go from being pagans to holy and beloved people? Justification. That's what Christ did on the cross. But what's sanctification? All these other things. Look at the rest of verse 12. Put on, uh, therefore... Tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Verse 13 of chapter 3 of Colossians. Bearing with one another, forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, as Christ forgave you, so also must you do. How do people get that way? How do they get to be forgiving and gentle and, and kind when they're formerly horrific and, and, and harsh and murderous? 
It's called sanctification. So justification is what Jesus did for me on the cross. Sanctification is what Christ is doing in me because of the cross. He did it for me on the cross. That's justification. Sanctification is now he's doing it in me because of what he did on the cross. So what you see is justification and sanctification are like two sides of the same coin. Anybody that God justifies, he will sanctify. See, God will not allow a believer to act like an unbeliever without interfering with their life. It's called chastisement. Justification is immediate. It completely was finished the instant I was saved. Sanctification goes on and it's never completed until we meet Jesus face to face. See, theologians call it progressive sanctification. And what happens is, Jesus wants to conform us a little bit more every day to look like him. And that's why the Bible, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, that this book is like a mirror. And we look in the mirror of this book, and what we see is the perfect image of Christ, and we see us reflected and go, whoa, I don't look like that. And then we say, Lord, I want you to conform me to your image. And 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with open faces, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, that seeing Christ in his word, are changed into his image. See, the goal of sanctification is to look less like the world and less like our father, the devil, John 8.44, and more and more every day like Christ. So justification is immediate, completely finished the instant I was saved. Sanctification goes on my whole life. Justification is activated the moment I trust in Christ. Sanctification grows with each obedient choice I make. Look again at Colossians 3.12. See, Paul built his whole teaching around this justification and sanctification. It says in, in verse 12, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, you're justified, put on. That's the sanctification, obedient choices we have to make. Now this morning I, I put on a blue and black striped shirt. It didn't tackle me. I looked and I saw and I chose and I put it on. This is how consciously this list is. We have to choose to put on tender mercies, having hearts of compassion. We have to put on kindness. We have to say, Lord, I want to put on humility. I want to put on your meekness, your long suffering. I want to, verse 13, bear with one another. Justification is my position declared right in God's sight. Sanctification is my practice made right by being conformed to Christ's image. See, justification happens once. Sanctification progresses all the way through our lives. Justification triggers sanctification. There are a lot of people that are trying to sanctify themselves. You can't. They're the ones that have all these rules and they're working like a, um, a little hamster on the wheel trying to keep up with all their list of rules and it just is so frustrating it never works. There's no supernatural power. When Bonnie and I were out uh, in our years at Grace Community Church working with John MacArthur on staff, Grace, which is a huge church, 10, 12,000 people on Sunday, I mean, it's just massive, had a garage sale once. They called it the World for Sale, and all the proceeds went to the kids going on missions trips. So the entire church of 10,000 brought all their stuff, and they, they made one of the parking lots, which is as big as a, a mall in a normal city, and they, they just filled the whole parking lot with tables, and all these people put their stuff on it. And I, I remember that uh, there was entire, like, six or, or eight, eight-foot tables of just radios. Now, do you remember when radios used to be big and boom boxes and all that stuff? That's how long ago this was. And there were these big radios like this with big antennas on them and everything. And, and people wanted to buy those things. But you don't want to buy it if it doesn't work. And so they had installed a whole table with plug-ins electrical plug-ins, and you could take your boom box and walk down and plug it in to see if it worked before you bought it. Well, I was standing at the garage sale, and one of the neighbors, a pagan, unsafe person, wanted to buy this boom box, and they carried it down and plugged it in, and as soon as the 
plugs went into the electrical outlet, out of the boombox came the voice of J. Vernon McGee. <laughs> Can you guess who owned that radio? A Christian. Can you guess what they did? They had a tune to, you know, listening to him teach through the Bible. All that radio needed was to be plugged into the power. Without the power, no message came out. Without justification, sanctification doesn't work. Justification is the power that makes us be able to do what verse 12 says. In my own strength, I cannot put on tender mercies. I can try all I want, but it'll wear out because I can't do that in the flesh. I can't be kind. I can't be humble. I can't be meek. I can't be long-suffering and bearing. And for a lot of people, Jesus said, they are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. That's what he said in Matthew 7. He said, many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do everything in the church and serve all the time? He says, yeah, you did. Didn't we teach? He said, yeah, you did, but I never knew you. You didn't have an intimate relation. You went through the motions but you didn't get the power source, the justified new heart that issues into the power to live this way. Ezekiel put it this way. Ezekiel 36, verse 26 says, God said, A new heart I will give you, a new spirit I will put within you. I will take away your stony heart, I will put in a soft heart, and I will cause you to keep my commandments. Now you see, salvation, Jonah 2.9 says, is of the Lord. Only God can transplant a new heart. Only God can empower us and take away the stony heart. Justification is my position declared right. So humility is just part of living this new life that Christ bought for us. The only way to unleash humility is to unleash Christ in our life. We were saved only by Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And so we live every day by faith. Now, how did Paul put it? He said to the Colossians, as you receive Jesus Christ, walk in him. How did you receive Jesus Christ? By faith. How do we walk in him? By faith. We were confronted when we were saved by the word of God. And the word of God convicted us of our sin and showed us our hopelessness and our lostness and our inability to ever be good enough. And what we did is we said, I believe you, God. I, I believe that I'm lost and you're my only hope. And I receive by faith your word. That's the same way the sanctification process works. I look at God's standard, and I look where I am, and I say, I fall short, but this is what you want, so I surrender to you and ask for your grace to conform me to the image of Christ. You know, we all look in the mirror, or we should, uh, and, and when we look in the mirror, if we see anything out of place, like me, I check if both of my hairs are in place. You know, it's just something I do. Uh, and I, I make sure, in fact, this is how I fix my hair. That's all you have to do. But I still look in the mirror. And when you see something in the mirror that's out of place, you do something about it. Uh, I once, when we were in that parsonage I told you about that didn't have any hallways, I also had to be careful getting up in the morning, getting ready and turning on lights because it woke everybody up. So I used to go to early 6 a.m. Bible studies. And so I remember one time I got all ready and shaved and everything and, and, and went to my Bible study at 6 a.m. At 7 a.m. I, I went to the donut shop on the way to the office and I got my coffee and donut. And as I was at the coffee and donut shop, there was a great big camera from Channel 6, the local affiliate, and they were filming everybody coming out of the donut shop. And so I held up my coffee and donut, said, it's great here at Alley's Donuts. And I smiled at the camera and walked on and drank my coffee and got into the office at quarter to eight. And my sweet secretary looked at me and she said, Pastor, do you mean to have your sweater on backward? <laughs> it was one of those cable knit sweaters that had, you know, the big collar and three buttons here. And they were here. In the dark, I had somehow gotten it on backward, and I had gone through an entire hour Bible study with a whole group of men, and no one, that's how men are, they don't want to bother anybody, you know, you know, you can have, you know, a great big piece of, uh, you know, shaving cream on your ear, and they wouldn't mention it because you might want it there, you know, and then I was on television, smiling with my donut and coffee with my backward sweater, and finally my secretary had enough grace of God and love to say, 
Is that how you want to be? You see, that's, if I would have looked in the mirror and not been afraid to wake up the kids, I would have seen that. We go through so much of life with our sweater backward because we never look in the mirror, nor are we surrounded by believers like my secretary who do look at the example of Christ and look at us and see what's not matched up. See, that's what church is supposed to be like. We're supposed to be looking at each other through the mirror of the Word of God and say, now I've known you for 10 years and you're just as impatient and anxious and fearful as you were 10 years ago. Did you know that doesn't please the Lord? That's what's supposed to go on in church. Not, hey, boy, you got a nice new car. You're getting a new boat, too. Where are you going on vacation? You're going on a cruise. Boy, you have a nice tan. Your grandkids, boy, they're doing great. That is not the purpose of church. The church, purpose of church is we're supposed to be exhorting one another and so much the more to look like Christ. Humility is just part of that new life. What can God's grace do to us? Well, look at Colossians 3 because there's actually a series of 14 imperative commands right here in the, the book of Colossians 3. Um, I mean, in the chapter 3 of Colossians. These are imperatives, starting in verse 1, and I'll just show you the imperatives. Remember, an imperative is God saying, this is what I want, are you going to respond yes or no? See, an imperative is not a suggestion, it's God saying, I want this, and we have to either say yes or no. Here's the first one in verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, or since you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. And the, the word seek is choose, choose to look for. Now, in my Michigan years, I was a hunter here. I mean, they got me addicted when I pastored over there at Calvary for nine years to deer hunting. And I mean, one of the men in the church owned a whole square mile, 640 acres. He had 30 stands and pit blinds all over his cornfields. And he would invite a group in, and you were always got a deer or two or three or however many tags you had. But you know, one of my sons never seemed to get one. And finally I checked on him. He would come with me hunting and he never seemed to get one. And I'd go to his stand and he was reading a book. I said, you can't get a deer if you're not looking. If you don't look, if you don't seek them, they don't come to your stand and say, shoot me. You know, they are out there doing life and you've got to watch them. And look for them. You know what Paul said? If you are risen with Christ, start looking for the things which are above. And it's a command. Set your sights not on things in the earth. Do you know how most people, most Christians that struggle with death, do you know what it is? If heaven is over here, they, they are going through life Looking at the world, heaven's here, and they're backing toward heaven. It's like, oh, I'm getting so old, I can't do what I used to do. Oh, I'm going to leave behind my houses and my... And here's heaven. They are being a tractor beam, pulling them to heaven because they're saved, but their affections are where? On earth. See what it says? It says, Seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And verse 2, set your mind on things above. Fo turn the, the, the scope of your life and, and the seeker toward things above. And so that the closer we get to the end of our lives, it's the, the destination we can't wait to get to is getting closer and closer and closer. Most people are backing toward heaven. And they look at earth as everything that they know and love. And heaven is just so mysterious and kind of like uh, Dave Hunt wrote a book once. It was titled Heaven Can Wait. And he said it's kind of like the mantra of America in whenever he wrote it in the 80s. I mean, I, I want my health and I want my diet and I want my travel and I want my pictures and I want my fun and I want all the stuff and, and the activities and amusements and I'm getting older and older and older, and I know heaven is back there somewhere, but I don't want to think about it too much because I'm thinking about this. And the whole premise of Colossians 1 is, turn your orientation that way. And those are the first two imperatives. Seek the things above, set your mind on things on the earth. Then it goes on, and it says in verse 5, here's the next imperative, put to death your members which are on the earth. And it 
it lists off everything the people in Colossae were struggling with. Remember what I told you it was like in Turkey? All the nudity? What's the first sin in the list? What are they supposed to put to death in verse 5? What's, what's the first word? Fornication. Now if you keep track, whenever the scriptures, either Jesus in the gospel or the apostles in the epistles, whenever they list off sins, there are 14 sin lists with multiple sins listed. If you ever put columns like this and look at the sin lists, like Romans 1 and here and you know, all the other ones, do you know what's either first or second in every list? Fornication. Sexual sin. Why? Because the Roman Empire was so sexually charged, kind of like modern day time. Do you, do you know what the New York Times says? It says that the primary portal of pornography has now become the mobile phone. That about 75 to 80 percent of all pornography right now flows through mobile phones. Why? Because you can be really all alone with your phone. And that is what has, well the mission, I told you I spoke at that mission um, sending 250 to India. You know what the, the head of the mission told me? He said 10 years ago we used to ask our students that were applying for missions whether they had ever been involved in any pornography. He said, we don't even ask anymore. We assume 100% of them have, and most of them struggle still. Now that's, that's different. When I was a little boy, pornography was that awful stuff they sold in liquor stores, you know, and it had paper you know, bags over it, and it was behind the liquor counter, and dirty old men would go to the liquor store and get it. And then it moved to the convenience stores, but they still had the covers over them. And then it moved into the stores, mainline, and then it moved into the movies, and now it's everywhere. And so most campus ministries working in America assume that both the boys and the girls. You ever heard of Tim LaHaye? Tim left behind LaHaye. He's now with the Lord. He, he said this. He says, when I was dating Beverly, he said they were in the military, and, and he said that Beverly came over to see me in my barracks, and he said it was kind of embarrassing because there were 40 men in the barracks and there were 60 pinup girls on the wall, which is boys. You know, they'd have their pinup girls. He said, I went over to visit Beverly's barracks, and there were 20 women in there and no pinup boys on the wall. But LaHaye said this. By the, the, when he wrote this in the 80s, he said, if you go to the barracks, there's just as so many pinup girls as boys in in fact, they've got shared barracks, you know. He said, it's just totally corroded. And the internet and the accessibility of the smartphone has put a warp speed. It is exponentially going down to the threshold now that most kids are exposed to pornography at 8 and 9 and 10. And they're just, by the time they get to be 13, when Bonnie and I go and minister in Europe, and, and, and train students that are saved in street ministry in Europe in their 20s. Those kids have already done the whole alcohol thing. They've already done the whole drug thing. They've been sexually active for a decade, and they're only 20. Two, three, four, and they've been sexually active for a decade. And they come to Christ, and boy, are they fervent. Because they said, we know how empty the drugs are. We know how empty the alcohol is. We know how empty all that promiscuity is. And we have found Christ. And they become the most dynamic witnesses and experience what God's grace can do in us. Well, what are these imperatives for? Look at verse 9. More imperatives. It says in verse 9, do not lie to one another. That is a command to believers because it's so easy for us to do it. If we're cornered, and someone catches us, our flesh wants us first choice to lie. It's very hard to be honest and say, you're right, I shouldn't have done that, I'm absolutely wrong. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds. Verse 10, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. See that idea, we're looking in the mirror and seeing the image? Verse 11, where there is neither Jew 
nor Greek, circumcised, nor uncircumcised. Now look at this, verse 11, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free. That's a very important verse. And if we were reading it on staff, the staff members would say hard word, hard word. You know, that Scythian thing and, and all that. But did you know that those, each of those words are vital? What Paul is saying is that Christ, through his spirit, through us obeying and allowing the justifying death of Christ to open the sanctifying life of Christ to us, he can strip off all the toxic ways of our flesh. What does that mean? Paul said there are certain things which the Colossians had to strip off from themselves. They had to say, God, I don't want that in my life anymore. Instead of comfortably going through life, it's kind of like we were driving, Bonnie and I were driving, um, this, the last two months we've traveled 10,000 miles. So we've seen a lot of 11 states and three countries, but a truck in front of us, the tire, you know how the tires and those big semis sometimes, you know, flip off and big strips of them just start flying and, and all these pieces were flying and so, you know, I'm getting out of the way but we get down the road a little bit and here's one of those smart cars. You know what a smart car is? It's one of those you can about pick it up. They're so close to the ground, grass would stop them, you know, but they get good gas mileage. Probably some of you have them, good, but don't, go around semis that are having their tires come off because that little smart car is so close to the ground that that piece of tire just, the car couldn't drive anymore. It just stopped. And they were off to the side tugging and pulling off that piece of, of tread of the tire of the semi because it stopped their car. You know what I think about when I see a lot of believers? They're driving along through life dragging all these things that are keeping them. And the scriptures say, strip those toxic ways of the flesh off. They keep you from going. It's a picture of the early life of the Christian. When a Christian was baptized in the ancient world, they took their old clothes, took them off, went down into the water. When they emerged, they put on a new white robe. They still do that in some of the Slavic countries. They have them wear these pure white robes as a picture when they come out of baptism of the new creation they are in Christ. Now, the baptism doesn't make us a new creation. I'm not saying that. But it pictures what Christ has already done in justification. So we're supposed to participate in sanctification. Salvation can completely change our personality. Uh, we put off the old self and Christ has put on the new self. Just as a candidate for baptism puts off their own clothes and puts new white ones on, uh, that's what Christ does. Now, look what it says in verse 11. Just, and it's almost time for lunch, but I want to show you. This is fascinating to me. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew. Now, we know what Greeks and Jews are. Greeks, people live in Greece. Jews, people that, that are descendants of Abraham. Uh, then it says circumcised and uncircumcised. We know what that is. Barbarian, what's that? Actually, the word is interesting, it's barbar in Greek. It, barbar, that's the word, barbar. That's how Greeks said that non-Greeks talked, barbar. They didn't talk nice like Greeks talked. Greeks spoke eloquently. Barbars, barbarians didn't. So a barbarian, but what's the next one? Scythians. Now that's interesting. Barbarians were those who were not Greeks and we would call them heathen today. Scythians were the worst kind of barbarians. Scythia is north of the Black Sea. It still is there. In fact, Scythia is the, the steps, the plains that lead up to Moscow. That whole area from the, the Black Sea up is the, the Scythian region. In fact, when I was teaching in, in Russia, they wanted to be nice and they took me to the Kremlin. The Kremlin has kind of the Smithsonian of Russia right in front of it, this giant museum. Do you know what the first exhibit when you go into the Kremlin Museum is? The Scythian heritage of Russia. They're proud of them. The Scythians were the most barbaric people of the ancient world. They could ride horses and they could clamp their legs on with no saddle onto the horse and they could turn around and shoot an arrow at full gallop with precision like a marksman. 
And they were so feared because they would get you chasing them and they'd pull up their arrows and turn around like that and pick you all off because you were so busy riding your horse chasing them. And when they got you, their practice was ISIS-like beheadings. And then they used the skull, which they cut in half like a grapefruit and cleaned it out. They would use the skull as a cup to drink from. That's why they were the ultimate barbarians. They were blood-drinking, head-cutting, skull-cracking, murderous marksmen that were feared greatly. They were kind of like the Mongols, if you ever heard of the Mongols. They were the most barbaric people the world had known. You talk about heathen, you talk about brutal, you talk about mean, they would scalp their enemies, they would use their skulls as a cup, they would drink the blood of their victims out of it. There is nothing more heathen than that. Now, they're called Scythians, and they lived in the Caucasus Mountains. Uh-oh. When we have checkboxes to put down what we are, have you ever noticed that one that says Caucasian? How many have ever seen Caucasian? That means that you come from the people that lived in the Caucasus Mountains. That's where they came from, the Scythians. You know, I, I, I know that most of us didn't, but that's where the Caucasian word comes from. Because these were white-skinned people as opposed to the Mongols who were dark-skinned. Do you know the ancestors of many of us who have white skin came from the territory after the flood of the Caucasus regions. They're called Caucasians after the area where these barbarians live. And you know what Paul was saying? That's why verse 11 is there. That's why it's so interesting to look at every word in the Bible. Paul said, even if you're a Scythian, even if you're a barbarian, even if you do those kind of things, salvation can completely change your personality. When I was pastoring in one church, there was this man that always bothered everybody in the church. He was a power walker. Nothing wrong with that, except he only wore little tiny shorts this big, just to the bottom of his pocket. That isn't enough. He, he would walk with those little tiny shorts on, glistening with sweat, muscular, with 15-pound weights, and he would kind of do this, and he'd walk through our parking lot, and all the ladies would go. And, and his, he was just the talk of the town. I don't think he had a job. Everywhere you saw him with his weights, he was doing his, his strutting around and, and building up the muscles he already had too many as it was. Well, one day, I was in my office reading and studying, and I heard a commotion outside, and all of a sudden, there was a sound at the door, and my secretary, the one that told me my shirt was, sweater was backward, was going like this, and here came him, the walker beating with sweat, and she didn't want to touch him, but she was trying to get between him and me, and she was holding her hands out, and she says, don't come in here, don't bother the pastor. And he walked right by her, and he walked into my office and set his weights down, and he said, I have a question for you, Father. Father? He was Roman Catholic. He thought I was a priest. Father? I said, yes, come in. And he set his weights down, and and my secretary said, is it safe? I said, yes, it's safe. Let him go. I've seen him in our parking lot all the time. And he said, I walk through your parking lot constantly. And I would like to ask you one question. I said, what? He said, why are the people in your parking lot so peaceful? He said, I love to walk through your parking lot on Sundays because he said, there is something peaceful about your people. I said, well, tell me about you. He was a barbarian. He said, I'm Delta Force, you know, Special Forces. He said, I'm fourth, fifth, sixth degree, black belt something. And he said, I love to work the bars. That's my job. I'm a bouncer at the bars. But he said, I love my job. He says, I'll wait until the prettiest girls are all lined up with their boyfriends at the bar. And he said, I slide in between a pretty girl and a boy and start talking to the girl and enrage the guy. And he says, I'm, I'm, I'm knowing I'm doing this. And he said, all of a sudden, the guy will push me and say, get away from my girl. And he said, I turn around and say, you're going to make me? And he says, I love to knock people out. He said, and I drag him out of the bar, and I always get the girl. He said, that's what I do. And he said, but I don't have any peace. 
And I said, would you like to know about peace? And I opened the Bible, and here's this man. I mean, can you imagine talking to a guy that has mini underwear on, and he's just dripping with sweat, and he looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger muscles. And so I took my Bible like this so I didn't have to look at him, you know, because he was standing right in front of me, and I said, let me read to you what the Bible says. I says, uh, and I explained to him, when the kindness and love of our God, our Savior, came toward us, appeared not by works of righteousness, and I went through Titus 3, 5, and then I went through the Romans road, and I was on, you know, about the fourth step of the Roman road, and I looked like this over my Bible, and he was gone. I thought, I shouldn't have, you know, covered my face. He got away. And then I looked like this, and there he was, on his knees, with his head down on the floor, and he said, I want it. And he prayed on the carpet, sweating, on our nice carpet, and cried out to the Lord right there. It was amazing. I didn't do anything. I didn't even ask him. He just dropped out of sight on his knees. And so I issued him a paperback copy of the Bible, and uh, I said, you need to read this, and we're gonna, I'll meet with you every week and, and teach you about the Bible. He came back for his first meeting the next week, he said, I found myself in the Bible. I said, you did? Yeah. He said, it was near where you were reading. It says, for we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But then the kindness and love of God appeared. He said, that's me. And he said, I'd like to be baptized. And you know that Sunday that he got up there, by the way, we put a robe on him, and he stood in the baptistry with those big muscles covered up and he pulled out his little paperback Bible and said, and read that verse, and he said, I'm the one that walked through your parking lot. And I'm the one that came here because you had peace. And he says, I was disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures. I lived in malice. He said, I used to love to knock people out and, and, and get the woman. And he says, I was hateful and hating, but the kindness and love of God appeared to me. That's what salvation does. But Paul said sanctified living is commanded. It's not optional. It's verse 12, as the elect of God put on. It's an heiress middle imperative. It's a commandment in the name of Christ to put on. To put on long-suffering, to put on meekness, to put on humility. Well, what Paul was saying to those people, he's still saying today. He says, why don't you just walk in the power of his grace today? He commands us to put on all those spiritual disciplines and be sanctified and gives us the grace and power to do it. All we have to do is choose to respond, which is what it means to practice biblical humility. It's time for lunch, so I'm going to pray, and then, ah, not Nathaniel. Nathaniel is coming. So let's stand if you want to, and I'm going to close in prayer. But as we pray, you have heard an awful lot. Uh, we've gone through an entire uh, theology of sanctification. But as we stand for the prayer, I'd like you to think about with me what response you want to make in your life. We're never supposed to hear and not respond. We're supposed to be hearers and doers. So think of one thing whether it's, it's maybe being more active in sharing the gospel, maybe it's going to be more active in stripping off the toxic ways. Maybe it's when you go to church, engaging in what sanctification is all about, going to other people and just asking them the simple questions, where are you in the Word? Boy, that's the most unnerving question you can ask a believer, especially if you remember what they said, because the second time you ask it, they say the same thing. You say, you were there last time. And they go, you remember? And I go, yeah, I do. And they go, I actually don't read, I just said that. Well, I'm going to ask you every time, and I want you to be in the Word. See, that's what ministry we're supposed to have to each other. Ask people, what verse are you meditating on? What's the last verse you memorized? And, and they look at you like, that's what church is about. That's what we're supposed to be doing to one another. That's how we encourage sanctification. Let's bow together. Father, I pray that you would lay on our hearts some of the holy responses that come because of the justifying death of Christ. Your death, O oh Christ, justifying us freely by your grace through the redemption that's in you, O oh Christ. 
opens for us sanctified living. There is no limit to how much you want to conform us to Christ. The only limit is us not cooperating. I pray that today we would make some choices to cooperate by your grace for your glory. In the precious name of Jesus we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.